Good morning and welcome this Lord's Day to the Freetown Road Church of Christ, this Sunday morning message. Um, to those that are watching, we want to encourage you to open up your Bibles with us as we go through the Scriptures uh, today. Uh, if you happen to be in the DFW Metroplex, whether you are moving to this area or passing through, we want to encourage you to reach out to us. We'd love to connect, to get to know you, let you know a little bit more about us as well. But we want to open our Bibles this morning to the Gospel according to John. John chapter 17. This is where we find our primary text. And it is the text from which we will launch ourselves as we begin our study of narrow accord. Of narrow accord, if you're taking notes. Now, John chapter 17, it is often referred to as the high priestly prayer. For it is where our high priest, that is Christ, Hebrews 4, verses 14 through 16, who has gone beyond the veil, he lifts his eyes to heaven and approaches the throne of the Father. And really, it's one of those eloquent passages of Scripture that causes Christians to feel as though they have stepped upon holy ground. For as we read through the various Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as we read through them, we see on several occasions how Christ, He went up to a mountain uh, uh, that was apart from everyone else to pray or some other solitary place where he continued all night in prayer to God. And we wonder, what did he say? How did Jesus, God the Son, pray to God the Father? What was on his mind the night of his betrayal? How should one pray amid trial and temptation? Well, in John chapter 17, it's all here. Now, we know from Matthew 6, there is what we call the Lord's Prayer. Uh, really, though, that's the disciples' prayer because it's where Jesus is instructing them how to pray and not necessarily how He comes to God. Yet here, in John chapter 17, it's somewhat more revealing. Uh, Brother Tom Waycaster describes it this way. The gate of heaven... No such prayer was ever heard before or since. It could only be uttered by the Lord and Savior of men, the mighty intercessor and mediator standing between heaven and earth. As has been said, this prayer occurred before Judas delivered him over to the soldiers and officers from the priests and Pharisees. It precedes entering Gethsemane. It was a night like any other and foretold before God laid the foundations of the world. I want you to imagine for a moment that you're one of those disciples. Filling the darkened streets of Jerusalem are the smells of fruits and wines and meats and blood from the Passover sacrifices. You have left the upper room and are making your way through this, through this city. The Savior is with you, and suddenly he stops to seek the face of God. Imagine that. You are walking along, and then he just stops to pray. Now, we could spend lifetimes poring over these 26 verses. Yeah, we're only going to glance at four of them before moving on. And we have to begin here to see the critical nature of our subject this Lord's Day. So let's go ahead and read these four verses now from John chapter 17, verses 20 through 23. Jesus, he is continuing in this prayer, and he says, Neither pray I for these alone, he says. Not just for those who, who are in his presence that night. Not for just those here, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Through the words of the men here, those that are with me, those of whom I love and have labored, I pray for them which shall believe on me through their word. He's praying about me. He's praying about you. That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee. 
that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. And that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Now it's the first words of verse 21 that I want to draw your attention to this morning. That they all may be one. Now there's little doubt that the Lord wants His people to dwell in unity. Over in Psalm 133 and verse 1, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's a statement that carries through to the New Testament as well. Writing to those in Corinth, Paul in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. If we are to be a people that pleases God, then we must seek out unity. It's not something that comes naturally because man is self-willed. He seeks his own. He doesn't naturally seek God. And that's why there's so many scriptures that warn against selfishness. We have to seek unity. Now, to be clear, God does not desire unity for unity's sake. Take, for example, Paul writing to those in Ephesus in Ephesians 5 in verse 11, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. He commanded roughly the same thing to the congregation in Corinth over in 2 Corinthians 6 in verse 17. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. So God desires unity, but he's not looking for unity for unity's sake. We don't allow ourselves to be led away by false doctrine, by false worship. We don't allow sin to entice us just so that we can be unified, even in the name of the Lord. We're, we're not going to, to bars and strip clubs just to say, well, I'm doing it for the cause of Christ. That's, that's not the unity God is talking about. But in times when the Lord desires unity among the brethren, we must do our part. And removing the obstacles that so often prevent us from being one as He and the Father are one. So that's our primary goal this morning, is to consider the barriers that prevent such fellowship. Now, we're not focusing on all areas as there are, unfortunately, too many. There are matters of opinion, matters of expediency, matters of practicality, and so on. So our sole focus for this Lord's Day is the Word of God itself. Now, question, how might some be disunified when it comes to the Bible? Just, th just think about that in your mind. Or if you're watching this online, just uh, pause the video. And just think, how might some be disunified when it comes to the Bible? How about they do not accept the Word of God? See, the Bible is the fully inspired thoughts of the Lord. We know from 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all Scripture is by inspiration of God, or God breathed, that is theonoustos. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now why? That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished. Your translation might say fully equipped unto all good works. All scripture. That means both testaments. Now the Jews might read it as every jot and tittle, as they mentioned in Matthew 5 in verse 18, is breathed out from heaven and is a living thing. It is, as Peter describes in 2 Peter 1 in verse 3, according as his divine power hath given us all things pertaining to life and godliness through a knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. He has called us out of the light, or out of the darkness rather, into the light with this living thing that he has breathed on to the pages of history. 
When a man refuses to accept God's divine word, there's a barrier in which the unbeliever throws out all moral standards. He or she can agree that something is right or wrong, but they have no principle by which to measure their opinion. It, le it leads to uncertainty and confusion. The prophet Amos would put it this way, can two walk together except they be agreed? You know, the other day I was watching an interview, uh, or it was a lecture, rather, with uh, Ben Shapiro. And someone was uh, questioning about rape. I believe it was Ben Shapiro. But someone was talking about rape and God allowing such things to, to happen. And it got on to the subject of morality. Uh, to which uh, Shapiro, or the gentleman who it was, replied, I can say that it's wrong because I have a moral standard that tells me right from wrong. You as an atheist, you say it's wrong, why? And the atheist could only respond, well, because it is. But what is your standard in saying that it's wrong? See, that's the idea. When someone, uh, when someone fails to accept the word of God, this barrier comes up and all other standards fall by the wayside. Now, one might not believe that this only occurs between Christians and atheists or agnostics, but you'd be wrong. There are some brethren who find no use for the Old Testament. However, it prophesies more than 351 times about the Savior. And Paul said to those in Rome, For whatsoever things were written aforetime, that means before, were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. So yes, even though we are New Testament Christians, even though the, the, the church was established, Acts chapter 2, in the New Testament, that the Old Testament has much to speak of. Not accepting the entirety of Scripture as inspired and purposeful causes more division than one would think. And even greater still is our number two, which is they do not know the Word of God. And indeed, there are a wealth of Christians who take the Scripture seriously. However, the narrow accord, the opposite of being of one accord, speaks to those who would believe the Bible, yet they do not seek to know them earnestly. We must know the standards by which we should live if we desire to dwell in unity. Over in John chapter 5, a famous chapter in, in the various witnesses for Christ, he says in verse 39, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify about me. They are they which testify about me, Christ says. You cannot know Christ without knowing the Bible. It's the foundation of belief. Romans 10 and verse 17, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by what? The Word of God. English Standard Version says the testimony of Christ. And again, the Gospel of, uh, according to John reminds us in chapter 8, verse 32, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now what is the truth that makes us free? In this same prayer of John 17 and verse 17, he would say, Sanctify them by your truth. Thy word is truth. So you have some that will accept the word of God. will say, okay, all 66 books, it's fine, it's, it's together, I understand that. You know, 40 some odd authors in there, human authors, the ultimate being God. There's no contradiction. Everything uh, flows fully and completely from Genesis to Revelation and Revelation to Genesis. I, I understand all of that. But then they don't want to know the Word of God. They don't earnestly seek to know God's Word, even though faith, it's not just talking about an initial faith when you come to a belief. It's a continual faith. Your faith comes from hearing the Word of God. The truth, which is God's Word, is what makes us free. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God. Why? 
a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly handling, rightly dividing the word of truth. If one does not know God's word because they're not working toward learning it, then how can one ever be approved of God? The answer is simple. They can't. It's impossible. It's impossible to be approved by God and not know God's word. Because God's word is the foundation of faith. It is our strength. Now there are some who they'll accept the scriptures. They know the scriptures, but they don't respect the scriptures. Now what do I mean by this? When referencing one who does not respect the Word of God. I'm talking about they do not respect their authority. In the book of Colossians, we find a very familiar verse. Colossians 3 and verse 17, And whatever you do in word and deed, do all in the name of the Lord, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Now I want you to read the middle of that verse again. Do all in the name of the Lord. To do all in the name of the Lord is to do what God has authorized. Not only in the gathered assembly, but in our homes and, and places of work as well. You see, frequently many take the authority of the Bible to mean that it only holds weight when we come together for, for worship or another function. Yet the same Christian may return home, set the Bible on a shelf, and there it stays until the next Lord's Day. It could be that right now there is someone sitting in their home, on their couch, watching this message, and yet the Bible has no authority. They're, they're up milling around in the kitchen or doing this or that, doing everything, and instead of paying attention to God's Word, they use it as background noise, like it's just some regular television show. Their Bible's not open in front of them. There are others, others will call the Bible archaic. And they'll whine and bemoan as saying, but it doesn't take into account the, the modern worship experience. God, when, this, when the Bible was written, He, he wasn't focused on, on, on me and, and what I wanted out of worship, what I needed to, to get out of worship. I'm not learning anything. It's old-fashioned. Are you telling me that God, who can see the end of the world itself, is somehow incapable of viewing today's events? You're telling me that God, the creator and sustainer of all things, did not know what was going to occur today. Or what you needed today. See, Jesus, he was explicit in the concluding chapter of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Again, there are a lot of people who they say, he wasn't thinking about me and, and what I wanted and what I desired. So I'm going to not respect the authority. I'm just going to put it to the side. It's archaic. And I'm going to do whatever I want to do. Because I'm the one that's important. You have people jumping around, hooting and hollering and, and everything else like a bunch of hyenas thinking that God is pleased. People rolling around on the floor thinking that God is pleased. You've got five or six singers up and you've got guitars and drums and everything else thinking God is pleased. Friends, God is not pleased. And there will come a time when those who are not worshiping in spirit and in truth will find, I don't know you. I never knew you. Just as you never really knew me. 
Now, you can reject the Word of God. You have that right. However, you do not have the authority to tell God what He does and does not consider. Isaiah 55 in verse 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. We have to remember that the Bible, that our faith, that everything we do for God is to lift us up toward Him. Not bring Him down toward us. Stop trying to dethrone the King. You either respect the Scripture's authority or you do not. There is no middle ground. There is no gray area. Well, I, I respect the New Testament, but not the, not the Old Testament. Or I want the, I want the New Testament God. I want that one, the, the God that's, that's more loving, the God that, that sacrificed His Son for me. That, that's the one that I want. I don't want the, I don't want the Old Testament God that, that caused wars or commanded wars to be done. I don't want the Old Testament God who, who brought famines upon people or, or death upon, upon the firstborn in Egypt. I, I don't want that one. I want, I want this one. Friends, let me tell you something. They are the same God. And that Old Testament God is the same God that's here in 2020 and will be in 2021 if He allows it to come, and 2022 and 2023 and so on. He is the same God. You either respect the Scripture's authority or you do not. But one cannot ignore the Bible and still expect unity. You can't. You cannot reject the Word of God and expect to be unified with those who accept it and respect it and understand its authority. And that ties closely to those who cause disunity because they don't obey the Word of God. John 14 and verse 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. And in reverse... John 15, 14, so John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. In John 15, 14, you're my friends if, if ye do whatsoever I command you. If we are to be a one accord, then it's critical to our salvation and God's glory that we do things which the Lord has given us to do. Luke 6, 46, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I say? Why are you calling me Lord if you're not going to pay attention? I've already told you that, that to show your love for me, you do what I say. To be counted as a friend, you, you do what I say. Why are you calling me Lord, Lord, but you're not doing these things? We cannot reject Scripture in any way and still expect unity. It is our obedience that unifies us. And now we reach our concluding point. The final failure, if you will. Mind you, one can accept, know, respect, and obey the Word of God, yet still fail in this last measure. And I would say that if they're failing in this last measure, then they're really not doing the others. And that is, they do not demand that others follow the Word of God. Now this is why I, as a preacher and minister of the gospel, get into trouble. And I feel confident in saying that most evangelists run into some difficulties on this matter. Why? Because here we are, imperfect people, demanding week in and week out that those who would call themselves Christians follow the word of God. However, the burden is shared when more Christians do the same. It's not enough for some in an assembly to obey the Scriptures while others deny. It overtaxes people. I want you to, to picture that it's nearing midnight and you wake to find your house on fire. You've called 911 and you run outside and you grab your water hose to do what you can and you're wetting down the side of your house and, and maybe the roof. And then all of a sudden you notice that your neighbor's house across the street behind you is also in flames. You want to help, but you can't. 
Because if you drop your hose and you go over there to help them, when you return, you're left with ashes. You have to put out your fire first. Now, I want you to imagine a congregation desiring growth, but divided in their obedience. How can the preacher or members who are willing to evangelize do so if they are continually battling on the home front? It's impossible. How can, how can a preacher or members go out into the community, evangelize, and, and people are gripped by the Word of God? They have that faith. They're ready to repent. They've been baptized. And then they come into the assembly and they see people who are not obedient to the Word of God or they are not fed the Word of God because people are only interested in themselves. How can anyone grow a congregation if there are constant battles on the home front? It's impossible. Now, what's the risk? Because there is a risk in demanding people follow the Word of God. Well, some may leave the local body, their faith being so tenuous that sincerely seeking the things of God appears harsh. It's also possible that people don't understand that there are rules, commandments, we call them, when it comes to being a Christian. And because of this, rebellion ensues. They fight God, they, they fight, uh, they argue with elders, they war with preachers, they defy anyone and everyone because they do not like rules. Unless, of course, they are involved in making them. And some, they may leave the local body because they say, you know what, I, I, I wasn't reared in the church. Uh, this is my first experience. And, and it seems like there's just a, a lot to deal with. Or maybe they were brought up in, in some type of religious belief system. But they say, you know what, I, I haven't heard the Bible this way before. And it just seems off to me. And instead of studying the scriptures, they pout and they run away. Is it plausible that the demand turns off some who are not yet Christians? Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's look at an example. In John chapter 6, Jesus, he is talking about the bread of life and that he is the bread of life. So I want us to read some of these verses together. John chapter 6 verses 60 through 67. If you're watching this online, just pause the video so that, you can, so that you can find this. I want you to see it. Do not take my word for it. Open your Bible, respect the Scriptures, and look. But John chapter 6, verses 60 through 67. Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, talking about the bread of life, he is the bread of life, said, this is an hard saying, who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they all were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man could come unto me except it were given unto him by my Father. From that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then Jesus said unto the twelve, Will you also go away? From that time many of his disciples went back. Now for Jesus, that could have been several hundred or even a few thousand based upon what we know in other points of Scripture on how many people He fed and, and how many were there on these various occasions. It could have been uh, several hundred or a few thousand. But notice what the text does not tell us. Because what it does say is often just as important as what it does not say. So I want us to see what it, it does not say here. It does not say... And Jesus called out after them and said, Please come back. I'm sorry for offending you. Nor does it read, And Jesus ran after the multitude with great tears, saying, Look, I was only joking. You really need to stop taking God so seriously. Come back. I promise it won't happen again. 
Do you think that Jesus did not care for them? Of course he did. Yet he was not going to compromise the word of God to satisfy the people. He wasn't interested in bending the rules to make them more palatable to the masses. Jesus said what he meant and he meant what he said. We have to understand that as well. When we say one plants and other waters and God gives the increase, the moment you start changing the word of God to suit the people is the moment you rob God and you no longer truly believe that God will give the increase. Because if you stick with the word of God, yes, some people may leave. But if you truly believe that God will give the increase, then in his time, he will do just that. Now, can the truth be spoken in an unloving way? Yes. Unfortunately, that does happen. But how the person reacts to it is on them. And when judgment comes, one cannot say that they were unfaithful because of an elder or a pe preacher or a congregant made them feel bad. It is ultimately up to them. And when we're talking about this idea of unity, if we respect, if we know the Word of God, accept the Word of God, if we respect the Word of God, then when it comes to conflict, we will do what the Word of God says. And people won't leave. Romans 1 and verse 16 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It's the power of God unto salvation, but only to those who believe and obey. To have unity, to be of one accord and not of narrow accord. We must accept the truth of God's Word. We must know the intricacies of God's Word. We must respect the authority of God's Word. We must obey the commandments of God's Word. And yes, we must demand that others do the same. The commission is to go out, teach, preach, evangelize, baptize, do all of these things. If you're not demanding that people follow the Scriptures, then you're not obeying them. You don't respect their authority. You don't know them. And you haven't really accepted them either. You can be one who progresses only with culture and not with Scripture, or you can be a Christian. You cannot be both. The Bible speaks to all men at all times. The Bible, the Word of God, the testimony of Christ, is how faith initially appears and how it is sustained. This morning... As you watch this message, I pray that you've had your Bible open. You've gone through these scriptures with us. It may be that you are in such a spiritual state that you have forgotten some of these things. It may be that the, you just happen to uh, get on your phone or on your laptop and and this is the first time you've heard the Word of God. If it is and it has touched you in such a way, we pray that you would contact a, a local sound church of Christ. Speak with one of the elders. Speak with the minister there, preacher. Reach out so that you might study continually with them. That you might come to an understanding. If you're not yet a Christian, then you, that way you might be baptized for the remission, the forgiveness, the passing over of your sins, rising up to be a new creation, walking in a new and fuller life, being obedient unto death, that you might receive that victor's crown. If you happen to be in this area, reach out to us. We would be more than happy to help. You may contact us. 
uh, online, our website, or, or by calling the office. But we're praying for you that you're healthy and that you're safe and that you will obey the Word of God.